Brothers and sisters, a reading from Acts 17. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching of Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and they brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know therefore what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing of something new. So, Paul standing in the midst of the Areopagus said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious, for I passed along and observed some of the objects that you worship. I found also an idol with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship was unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they may, might fill their way to him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for indeed we are his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art or imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. This is the word of the Lord. Do you know him? Second, third century church father, lawyer, rhetorician Tertullian asks the perennial question, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? That is, what has Athens of the academy to do with the Jerusalem of Christianity? What has the Athens of culture to do with the Jerusalem of the church? What has the Athens of philosophy to do with the Jerusalem of theology? What has the Athens of reason to do with the Jerusalem of faith? What has the Athens of Socrates to do with the Jerusalem of Paul? This question has often been quoted and yet often misunderstood and misapplied. Paul is not saying that Athens and Jerusalem have nothing to do with each other because after all the threads of Athens and Jerusalem are inextricably tied together and woven together in the garment of our mission. Jesus himself says in Matthew 5, 13, you are 
the salt of the earth. And therefore, the Jerusalem, the salt, penetrates the rot of Athens. Jesus says to us in Matthew 5, 16, you are the light of the world. And the Jerusalem of light illumines the dense darkness of Athens. Athens and Jerusalem share together in a mission that God has ordained. But I think that Paul is lifting up this text and we are looking through the lens of church history and we're hearing Tertullian asked it as if he is critiquing the Athens type preachers who pose as those who really are proclaiming the gospel message of Jerusalem. I think he wants us to see that preachers who say that they're preaching the gospel are really Athens preachers. Those who are, as Jesus would put it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, they are really wolves dressed up in sheep clothing. These are Athens type preachers and yet they say that they represent the preachment of Jerusalem. And we hear Paul describe uh, the preachers of Jerusalem as being those who rightly cut straight the word of truth in 2 Timothy 2.15, but Tertullian is really saying that these preachers are those who are not cutting straight the word of truth. They're not exegeting, they're eisegeting the text, they're twisting the text, they're perverting the text, they are really Athens-type preachers. I think that he would be glad, that is Tertullian, glad to call for a redemptive reversal of this question because the sanctified sequence really makes a difference. It's Ansam in his Pros Logion, which is his discourse on the existence for the, for the arguments for the existence of God, who has this dictum. Faith seeking understanding. I believe in order to understand. Not I understand in order to believe, but I believe in order to understand. I start with faith. It's as if Paul would say to us in 2 Timothy 1 and 12, I know whom I believe and I know he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. For the truth of the matter is, we have faith. And we're on the way toward understanding and we may not ever arrive there. There are things we may not ever understand and yet we believe and we worship. I will never understand why I was in the same position as my son five years ago when he was there, when he was gunned down and 30 some years ago I was arrested. Gunpoint and I lived, I never understand that. I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from the sunshine for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry about the future for I know what Jesus said and today he walks beside me for he knows what lies ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand but I don't know what. I don't know why, I don't know where, I don't know when but I know who holds tomorrow and I know who holds my hand. The Apostle Paul finds himself alone in Athens, Timothy and Silas are going to join him from Berea, but they have not yet arrived. And in verse 16 of this chapter, Paul enters the city of Athens. It has now been eclipsed by Corinth. Corinth is the great city. The days of Athens, in terms of its glory, golden days are over. Fifth century B.C., but now Athens has been reduced to a population of about 5,000 people, still an important city. And Paul comes to this city alone. He looks around and the NIV says that he is greatly distressed by the multitudinous idols that he sees. Distress, paroxuno. It's the same Greek root of that word in Acts 15, 39, where Paul and Barnabas have a sharp contention over whether John Mark will go on the second missionary journey with them. Sharp dispute, paroxuno. It is 
a word that suggests that Paul is provoked. He's irritated. He's exasperated because he sees all of these idols everywhere he looks. Idols. He's a monotheist. He believes in the Shema. Behold, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He's not a polytheist. Everywhere he looks yonder, there he is Hades, the god of the underworld. Yonder there is Hermes, the god of speed and commerce. Yonder there is Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty. And yonder there is Apollo, the god of the sun. And yonder there is Aritamus, the god of the moon. And yonder there is Nike, the goddess of victory. And yonder there is Eros, the god of love. And Poseidon, the god of the sea. And Zeus, the chief of the gods. And he's exasperated when he sees these gods. He's irritated. He chooses in verse 17 to go into the synagogue. There must have been a sizable enough uh, population of Jews that there would be a synagogue there because one had to have 10 households of Jewish families over which a male was the head. He goes in the synagogue and he reasons with the Jews. There's some God-fearing Greeks who are there who are on the verge of converting from being a polytheist to being a monotheist, a believer in one God, coming to the religion of Judaism. And he goes into the marketplace and he reasons with people there. It's going to be on, on the subject of resurrection, verse 18, resurrection, verse 31, resurrection, verse 32. There in the marketplace, undoubtedly, he is encountered and confronted with Stoics and with Epicureans, two of the philosophical schools in Athens. They challenge him because the Epicureans did not believe that their existence was fated by the gods. There was distance between them and the gods. They didn't believe in the afterlife. The essence of Epicureanism was that of pleasure. You want to see and hear Epicureanism on display in terms of its essence? You read of the barn building fool in Luke 12, 19, who says to himself, listen to his soliloquy, his self-conversation. So you have many years laid up for you. Eat, drink, and be merry. I want you to know all Epicureans are not dead even today. That was the essence of it. But it was disciplined hedonism. It was discipline and it was restrained pleasure. They believed that once you died, you, you were dead. It was all over. And Paul, I think, is borrowing from their philosophy and confronting them with it and saying to them, the pleasure you really need, verse number 27, is to seek God so that you might grope after God and find God. Because really what God has done, God has put within all of us a God-sized hole that nothing else can fill. Nobody else can enter that and give us satisfaction. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. But then I heard my master speaking, draw from the well that never will run dry. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup. Fill it up and make me whole. But there is the other philosophical school, the Stoics. They believed in life after death. They believe that there remain a demiurge, a divine spark after the, de the decomposition of the body. 
and they believed that their lives were governed by the gods. And the essence of their philosophy was wisdom. They hated the word ignorance. And I believe Paul is using uh, that and turning it against them. He says, in essence, in verses 22 and 23, I, I saw a, a, an inscription as I entered your precincts, and it is an, an inscription to the agnostheos, the unknown God. You worship what you don't know. That's ignorance. And I think Paul is saying in verse number 30, there was a time when God used to wink at ignorance, but now since the full revelation, revelation of God, the highest revelation of God has come in Jesus Christ, he commands that people everywhere repent. So Paul is using their culture as a boomerang and throwing it so that it attacks them. They believed that you existed in a uh, disembodied spirit after you were dead. Well, they charged Paul with being a babbler. A babbler. That is a seed picker. They said, Paul, you are you're like a bird flitting around trying to pick up bits of food with your beak. You are a seed picker. You, you are an amateur. You are a plagiarist. You are just merely parroting back ideas that you heard from someone else. You don't have any original thoughts, these strange ideas. Verse number 18 that you're bringing up about foreign deities. And this unheard of concept of your God, deity, dying and rising from the dead. That deity can die? That's strange. It's unheard of. You are a babbler. They didn't know that Paul evidently had graduated from the University of Tarsus in Cilicia. They didn't know evidently that he had sat at the feet of Gamaliel, the celebrated and famed Jewish rabbi, and they would not know that Paul would write over half of the New Testament, and yet they called him a babbler, a seed picker. He is escorted in verse 19 and 20, he is escorted to the Areopagus. The Areopagus is a place, and yet it is an organization. It's a system. My wife and I stood there on the hill of the Areopagus about five months ago. Ares, the hill of the Areopagus, the hill of Ares in Greek. Mars, the hill of Mars in the Roman language. And there on that hill, 30 members approximately, very elite members would sit there and talk and discuss court cases and criminal and civil matters. And perhaps even discuss over whether new gods were to be inducted into a directory of deities. Paul is invited to come and defend uh, his strange doctrine. It's a place and yet it represents an organization much like uh, the Wall Street. We call it Wall Street. Wall Street is a street, 23 Wall Street, New York, New York, but it is a stock exchange. And these members are sitting there every day and the text says in verse 21, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there did was to talk about something that was new. They invite Paul to come and talk about something they'd never heard of. They are at least open to him discussing a new doctrine. I wonder sometimes if the world does not usher to us a more hospitable, and I know this is not a hospitable crowd here at the Areopagus, but they are at least willing to hear. I wonder if they don't provide for us an example that we need today. Are we willing to hear something? I don't mean just talking at each other, but talking to each other. Are we able and willing to hear even though we have denominational differences? Are we willing to really hear each other though we have ethnic peculiarities? Are we really willing to hear, even though we have liturgical preferences? Are we willing to hear, even though we have 
theological particularities to listen to each other, to talk not at, but to each other. And Paul is invited to stand before this august body of philosophers and defend his innovative doctrine because that's all they did in verse 21 was to talk about something that was new, something that was innovative, something that was novel. And he stands and says, I entered your precincts and I see that you are religious. That is, you are superstitious. I've seen all your gods. I've seen the pantheon and uh, the idolatrous memorabilia that's in there. But I noticed something that was strange. I saw an inscription to an unknown God, an agnos theos. I came to tell you that the God that you worship that you don't know, I know him. And I want to ask you the question today, do you know him? Dr. Paul House in his book on Bonhoeffer's Seminary Vision has said in the opening line of chapter 3, how Christians think about God determines how they think about everything else. Maybe we are caricaturing God because we want God to be the kind of God we want God to be. God has made us in his own image and after his own likeness and we have tried to bring God down to our level and make God in our own image and after our own likeness. It's really what J.B. Phillips is talking about in his little book, Your God is Too Small, and he provides several caricatures of God. The God as resident policeman who walks the heavenly beat and looks down at us and sees when we sin and then takes his divine billy club and beats us on top of the head. I submit to you that is not the God of the Bible because if it was, we would be headless today or the God who is the grand old man, the God who has been God and is God, sovereign, but has senior moments, has senior-itis, the God who is almighty and yet is affected by amnesia and Alzheimer's, the God who is divine and yet he is a God who is suffering with dementia and we get away with sin and he forgets. That's not the God of the Bible. My favorite one is the God of the box. The God that we never pay attention to until an emergency or crisis occurs and then we take and rub his stomach and God comes out of the box to deliver us. God is not that kind of God. How we think of God determines how we think of everything else. It's S.M. Lockridge, Shadrach, Meshach, Lockridge of the Calvary Baptist Church of San Diego many years ago asked uh, that same question about do we really know God in his poetic rendition, that's my king. He says God is a sovereign God. He's a sevenfold God. He's the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of glory. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of kings and he's the king of righteousness. And then he asks, do you know him? He is the sovereign king. He is enduringly strong. He is entirely sincere. He is eternally great. He is imperially powerful. He's impartially graceful. Then he asked, do you know him? He is a phenomenal God. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He is the loftiest idea in literature. I wonder, do you know him? He is one that the Pharisees couldn't stand. Pilate could not find fault in. He's the one that death couldn't handle and the grave could not hold him. Do you know him? I want to ask the question again, do you really know him? Because you can't get him off your hand. You can't get him out of your hearts. You can't outlive him and you sure enough can't live without him. Do you know him? Billows may roll, breakers may dash, eyes shall not sway 
because he holds me fast. Though dark the day, clouds in the sky. I know it's all right because Jesus is nigh. Oh, do you know him? I submit to you this morning that the unknown God is made known through the resurrected Jesus who calls all people to seek him in repentance through the power of the Holy Spirit. The unknown God is made known through the resurrected Jesus who calls all people to seek him in repentance through the power of the Spirit. Paul says, I know him. And he goes on to talk about this great God, verse number 24. He's a God who is the creator. He has created everything. He is the triune God who does it. That is Father, Son, and Spirit. Across the breadth of the writings of Jonathan Edwards, there is this crystallized reality, this crystallized truth that God has forever known himself in a sweet and holy society as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That he has forever known himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Even in creation, the Father stands on nothing and says, let there be. The Spirit broods upon the face of the water. And according to Colossians 1, 17, by the Son, all things hold together. Because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are involved in creation. They're involved in redemption. They're involved in the great creation. One God in three persons, blessed Trinity. He creates all things, and yet he does not live in temples like the temples that you have housing your gods. He doesn't live in temples made by human hands, which has to be a reflection on the dedicatory prayer of Solomon, who prayed that prayer that though this temple is beautiful, God is not housed in it. Verse number 25, he is the giver of everything. He gives everything, and yet he doesn't need anything from anyone. He is no one's debtor. In fact, he even gives breath. I'm always moved by that because I recognize that no matter how many companies we have, there's not one company that's making breath. <laughs> Only God gives breath. So the psalmist says in Psalm 150, to close that psalm, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So everything uh, that praises the Lord has breath. Because when you don't have breath, you don't praise him in the grave. Therefore, when you come to a place like this, you come to praise the Lord. You come to give him glory. You don't come as a, spe as a spectator. You come as a participator to give him praise for who he is and to thank him for what he's done. Verse number 26. He is the God um, who has made the whole human race out of one person. We all come from Adam by creation. I think sometimes that our missio day is less effective because we have an incorrect imago day. If I can understand that everyone on planet earth has been made in God's image, then my missio day, the mission of God, would not be limited. Slavery could never have existed if we had a correct imago day. So when you have a correct Imago Day and an effective Missio Day, you do it for sole Deo glory, for the glory of God in anticipation of Maranatha that Jesus is coming again. And here Paul is saying that this God has made all of us from one blood. We've all come from one person. Verse number 27, that this God is a God who wants us to seek him, to grope after him that we might find him. It is Siddhartha Gautama, the founder of Buddhism, as a young lad who desired to find God. And that word got around the village that he wanted to find God and he was referred uh, to some pundits, some sages. Uh, the griot up in the hill country. He went up to the hill country and found one of the sages and started talking to the sage about finding God who took him down to a pool of water as they dabbled their feet in the water and talked about finding God, that sage with an ironclad grip took the back of his neck and plunged his head in the water. And as Siddhartha Gautama tried to free himself from the grip of the sage, he realized that it was in vain, it was futile. 
uh, he surrendered himself to die when all of a sudden the sage pulled him out of the water. And when he cleared his throat, Siddhartha Gautama began to protest about how the sage had treated him. And the sage responded, when you want God as much as you wanted that next breath of air, then you'll find God. For Jeremiah 29 and 13 reminds us, and you shall seek him and find him after you have sought him with your whole heart. God desires for people to find him. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, Isaiah says in 55, 6. Call upon him while he is near. Verse 28, that this is the God in whom we live, we move, and we have our being. We exist because of him, as some of your poets say. Paul is not only going to be scripturally accurate, but culturally accurate and borrow from the cultural philosophy of those who lived in Athens. Verse 29, he says that this God cannot be made with silver and gold. You don't fashion God at all. This is a God that is not malleable. This is a God that you can't form. This is a God who is sovereign and resists to be put in anybody's ecclesiastical, denominational, ethnic box. This is the sovereign God of the universe. And he said there was a time that God used to wink at ignorance. But now that the full revelation of God has come in the person of Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, the Word, God, became flesh. God became what he was not, flesh, and yet remained who he was, God and dwelt among us, and as Eugene Peterson says, that he moved into the neighborhood, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's not winking at ignorance, but he is calling people everywhere to repent, and repentance cannot take place without the moving of the Spirit. It's the Spirit, according to John 16, 7 through 9, when the spirit of truth has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. It is the internal witness of the spirit, as Calvin would put it, who takes the word that's preached and applies it to the heart and cuts people to the heart, even to the place that they say what they said on the day of Pentecost. What must we do to be saved? Men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter will say, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the mission of sin in the name of Jesus Christ, and you'll receive the gift of the, the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who establishes and stimulates repentance. I keep trying to tell you that this unknown God is made known by the resurrected Jesus who calls people to repentance and does it through the person of the Spirit of God. The Bible says in verse 31 that Paul establishes the cardinal doctrine of Christianity, the one upon which the whole church stands or fall. That is the resurrection. He preached the resurrection of Jesus. That there's coming a time, Paul says, where God will judge the world by righteousness and justice. And he has confirmed that by raising him from the dead. Paul spends one whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, to show why the crucifixion was not enough. It wasn't enough for Jesus to die. He had to get up. And had he not been resurrected from the dead, then you and I would be sitting here in vain. I'm glad he died, but I'm glad he rose and got up from the grave. Well, he talked about the resurrection and at that, that particular point, the scripture says in verse 32 that this group of men of the Areopagus began to sneer, to mock. They were rejecting him and others said, look, we want to reschedule this, much like what Felix said in Acts chapter 24, 25, let's put this on the calendar for another time. We want to procrastinate. And at that point, verse 33, Paul began to walk out of the crowd. Some think that he was not just walking out, but that he was mistreated and forced out. But he went out, but not without the word having a witness. I want you to know that my responsibility 
is not to make a witness. My responsibility is to give the word and the word will not go out void, but it will accomplish that for which it was sent. For the Bible says in verse 34, there is a result. There is Dionysius, who is a member of the Areopagus, who believes. And there is Damaris, who is probably one of the leading ladies, who believes. And others who follow Paul and believe his teaching. Don't be discouraged when you don't get instant responses. Know that the word will make his own witness. I'm not of the crowd who believes that Paul failed at Mars Hill, or if you will, at the Areopagus, because he didn't preach Jesus. He did preach Jesus. Verse 18 tells us he preached Jesus. Verse number 31 says he preached Jesus and the resurrection. And he will say in 1 Corinthians 2 and 2, I would not know anything except Jesus and him crucified. But I think there are times when you and I will be so affected by the lack of responses from our people, from our students, from our family members, from members of our churches, and it will seem as if what we've done, we've done it in vain. And we'll wonder who we really are. But the answer to the question of who I am can only be found in the response that I am thine, O Lord. I think Bonhoeffer went through that. He's rejected by the German church. He's misunderstood by people in the confessing church. In New York City and in America, he is a person who has a seminary, but away from home, who lives in another country, away from his own country. And on that day, April the 9th, 1945, as he walks out of the Flossenburg jail, says goodbye to his fellow inmates. He said, for you, it is the end of life, but for me, it is the beginning. And he leaves us with this poem. Who am I? They often tell me I step from my sales confinement, calmly, cheerfully, firmly, like a squire in his country house. Who am I? They often tell me I used to speak to my warders freely and friendly and clearly as though it were mine to command. Who am I? They also tell me that I bore the days of misfortune equably, smilingly, proudly, like one accustomed to win. Am I really then that which other men tell of? Or am I only what I myself know of myself, restless and longing and sick, like a bird with hands compressing my throat, thirsting for words of kindness, for neighborliness, tossing in expectation of great events, powerlessly trembling for friends at an infinite distance, weary and empty, at praying, at thinking, at making, faint and ready to say farewell to it all. Who am I, this or the other? Am I one person today and tomorrow another? Am I both at once a hypocrite before others and before myself a contemptible, woebegone weakling? Or is there is something within me still like a beaten army fleeing in disorder from victory already achieved? Who am I? They mock me. These lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am, thou knowest, O God, I am thine. And you and I must get to the place that regardless of results or lack of results, we know who we are because of whose we are. I take comfort in saying, I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and have told thy love to me. But uh, I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. For consecrate me now 
to my service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let uh, my faith look up with a steadfast hope and my will be lost in thine. Well, there are depths of love that I may not know till I reach the narrow sea. And there are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with thee. But until that time, I want to tell the Lord, uh, draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Oh, yeah, draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. I want you to know I may not know much about calculus, and I struggled with trigonometry, and I had a hard time with physics, but I know him. He is my king, he is my lord, and he is everything that I need. Do you know him?